Wow, I'm already on. Good evening. Nice to be in Florida, isn't it? Well, that's relatively speaking, depending on where you came from, right? I left Chicago yesterday morning. It was 19. We were having a heat wave. It's 19 degrees. And I uh, got off the plane down here. I don't, I don't know what temperature it was, but uh, it was nice. <laughs> I told folks last night where I, was, where we were, I said, this is the first time in, since October that I haven't had on long johns. <laughs> well, I mean, except when I'm taking a shower. But uh, <laughs> good to see you tonight. <laughs> okay, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Uh, the point is, it's just nice to be out and about. Nice to see you. We've got folks from California. This is about the dumbest invention I think I've ever seen. I, when Russ gave it to me, I said, what do you do with it? He said, you hang it on your head. So I, I, it's hanging on my head, okay? So it is what it is. Looks like a growth coming out of the side of my head. I looked at it, but it'll, it's working, so that, that's okay. Um, something important I was going to tell you, and I forgot what it was. But uh, it, anyway, I, it is good to be be able to be back with you. I, last year we weren't able to come. Actually, in the last several years I've missed coming twice because of uh, my father-in-law died a couple of years ago, went to be with the Lord. And the weekend that you were here, we were there in Mobile uh, having his uh, memorial. And then last year, I was supposed to have heart surgery on the, uh, I think it was the 19th, 17th of long there of December. I've forgotten now the exact date. But it was a Tuesday, and the Friday before that, I went to the doctor because I had to have that last checkup. The seventh Pearl Harbor day, they did a, a heart cath where they go up and look at your heart and do all the measurements, get everything ready so they can order the valve and everything. And uh, that was a Friday. The next Sunday afternoon, Monday, uh, I drove to Scranton, Pennsylvania for some meetings out there for that week, and my, my, my leg hurt real bad. I just thought, you know, you're driving in the car, and, and it's, you know, you, that long and so forth, and they just, you know, stuck stuff up in you and so forth, so forth. So you, and I'm there for the week, and I drive back. My legs hurting bad. I go to the doctor, and he's, you know, he said, "What, you know, why are you limping and stuff?" And I said that he said, "I'm just going to have a sonogram." Uh, I don't, you know. So I go down, and you know, when you go to the doctor, and you you go and have a test, and they come in, they go zip 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 zip, and you can go. And then you go in, and they go zip 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 zip. Sit here just a minute. And they go get their supervisor and come in. They go, zip, zip, zip. And they said, sit here a minute. Then they go get their supervisor and come in. You got the idea something ain't going right. So they said, well, you, you need to go sit out. The doctor wants to talk to you. So he calls me on the phone out in the waiting room. And my wife and I are sitting there. And uh, you know, I said, something isn't right. He says, they just found a deep uh, deep vein thrombosis, thrombos thrombosis. And I said, a who? He said, well, a, a blood clot. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> And they, so, they, so instead of having the heart surgery, I, they, in fact, he says, you have to go in the hospital. And I'm thinking, I've never been in the hospital in my life. I'm thinking, tomorrow's okay, right? I, he, this is 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I had an appointment at 5 o'clock. I said, Doc, I got an appointment at 5 o'clock. Can I do it after? He said, no, you got to go right now. Wheelchair's on the way, blah, blah, blah. So they stuck me in the hospital and started sticking stuff in me. And so they had to postpone the surgery. And that was postponed until they got the blood clot under control. A few days before the blood, I, I go in the surgery, I go back into the doctor, and he says, you know, there's something not right. Sent me to an angiogram again. This time they found an aneurysm. The blood clot was in the vein, aneurysm in the artery, the blood in the vein, the aneurysm in the artery. So now they got to fix that. Now that's a weird thing, too. So, I, you know, I'm getting real familiar with doctors from the patient side. And they fixed that. So then they go and do the surgery, and I come out, and, you know, you go through all that stuff. Um, my wife can tell you all kinds of stories about things that she claims that I did that I'm not sure I did, but uh, just life. I go home from that, woke up one morning, I got real bad chills. I think I got the flu, call the doctor and go in. They said, we want you to go to the hospital and look, have a, you know, it turned out I had a blood infection. And that actually was a lot worse as far as just affecting you than the heart surgery was. And uh, I, I go through that and I... Uh, Nine days in the hospital, sticking you three, you know, blood draws every three times a day. And then six weeks every day going back to get the daptomycin, the, the antibiotic. By the time that's over with, you're really up to here with, uh, with the doctors. And you're also thanking God for Medicare. 
And uh, I don't even want to tell you how much all that stuff costs. But uh, I, I've discovered that doctor's instructions are often very difficult to follow. You heard about the guy that went to the doctor wanted to lose some weight? And the doctor says, now, if you'll do what I tell you, you eat this food day one, this food day two, and then you skip a day. Then you eat this food one day one, eat this food day two, skip a day. You do that for two weeks, you'll lose five pounds. Come back. He went back after two weeks. He'd lost 20 pounds. Doc said, whoa, that's great. Did you, what'd you do? He said, I followed your instructions exactly to a T. And the doctor said, wow. That, that, <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's amazing. He, he said, yeah, you know, I followed your instructions to a T, but I thought I was going to drop dead that third day. He said, well, you, you real hungry? He said, no, no, from all that skipping. So that's you know you, you you figure that stuff out and figure out how to follow. My wife called me this morning and said did, first thing she says now is did you take your pills? And uh, I lied to her this morning and told her. And she said did you take your pill last night? And I I, I said yes ma'am. And uh, I haven't taken them this morning but I'm gonna. And I did. I opened up the thing, looked at it. There are my pills. And I didn't take the one last night. See I'm either lying to her or, or my memory's gone. I think it's the memory's gone. Three guys went to a conference like this, and they they got a room in the 75th floor of this fancy hotel, convention center. They go in after the meetings, and the, the, the elevator's not working. Now they got to walk. Got their bags. They said, man, this is going to be a long walk. Jim, John, and Sal. Jim says, I know what let's do first 25 stories uh, floors I'll uh, I'll tell I'll, I'll tell tell uh, I'll tell stories the second 25 floors Jim can sing songs and the last 25 stories Sal can tell jokes okay so they trudge up Jim tells his stories Sal sings his songs I'm sorry, John sings his songs, get to the 50th floor, Sal's going to tell jokes. And he says, I think I'll start with my, 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 my saddest. What's that? I left the room key in the car. <laughs> Can I tell you, that's the way sometimes you feel about that stuff, you know. Ephesians chapter number 2. I was going to say a moment ago, the folks here from far west California, brother here from Haiti, fam his fam not just him, but others in his family, other places, uh, it's a real privilege to be able to fellowship with so many people from so many different places. I, uh, we have a fellow who's been calling our office for, for the past six weeks, about once a week now, from Dubai. I have a guy calls me about every third day from Australia. I'd be happy to give you his phone number if you'd like it, and if you'd take <laughs> 7 o'clock in the morning, you call him, you know. And, but this guy from Dubai calls, and uh, he's learning right division. He's in a, a church of South India, an Anglican-type church. And we were talking to him and said, you know, you, you keep learning this, you're going to get in trouble and uh, have some problems with it. He says, oh, I already know. He said, I already got kicked out of one church for one thing. I'm willing so, you know, that, that's what you, you just have to have a willing heart. And it's an exciting thing to see. I sat in the airport yesterday morning, shared the gospel with a young guy. And uh, it, it's, it's fascinating to me how the culture we live in and that uh, business people, people that you meet, you know, when I'm, I, I am in the Two Million Mile Club, by the way, uh, Russ mentioned. And I, I, I fly, in, you know, normally two to six times a month. And so I get around a lot of people in the airport. And when I fly, I, I used to sit off on the side, meet a lot of business people, 
a uh, man from Nepal not long ago had the opportunity to actually trust in Christ sitting in the in the in the uh, waiting room there at, at O'Hare, American Airlines. We've got he was in first class. I'm in the back of the in the plane. The plane got canceled, and the pilot don't want to fly. You don't want to go. So we all got off. We're standing in front of the counter getting our, our reschedule and stuff. We got to talking, and uh, he says, "Why don't you know? Let's go over here and sit down." We go over to actually went over to the uh, the American Airlines lounge, and uh, the the well, the, the Admiral's Club, where, where you go and sit out of the, out of the uh, terminal. And he want, he asked me to go with it because he, he wanted to hear more. You know, here's a guy from Italy, Roman Catholic all his life, but not by, con, you know, any more than just tradition. The gospel's a, is the, the gospel's the power of God to salvation. And people out there with hungry hearts that, uh, as, and as, as the paganism and the superstition takes over our world, um, that isn't it, 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 it's that isn't something to fear. It's there's an opportunity there, because you're just going back. You, the worst thing you're ever going to have to do is go back to the world Paul lived in. You know, and uh, he he had a fairly successful ministry, and you can too. And it's just a wonderful day for that. And I, I just I'm grateful for that. Ephesians chapter two. I, I'm talking to you and find your Bible, find your verse. What's the matter? Half the time you can't hear. Talk to that dude over there. Bring it around. That. Whoa, whoa. You can hear that? I I can hear that. Okay. That's your job if you can't hear anymore. Okay. All right, Ephesians chapter 2. My topic is the ages to come. It comes out of verse number 7, but... I'm really going to introduce what we're going to talk about this weekend in regard to things to come. Everybody's interested in the future. You know, people want to know what's going to happen in the future. And there's there's almost a, uh, it's just a weird curiosity about the future. You can you talk about that and announce that as a topic. And, you know, people go, ooh, we're going to talk about prophecy and talk about the future. Revelation 19, verse 10 John says, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. Uh, I can tell you about the future. If you have the testimony of Christ tonight, you know where you're going to go when you die. I mean, that's, 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 you've got a testimony about that. You know, what the, you know what the future holds absolutely, positively, for sure, in the eternal sense. You say, well, I know what I'm going to do tomorrow, but that isn't going to last. Where you spend eternity is going to last forever. So there's an issue about that. Isaiah chapter 41, God says that the way, you, the way I'm going to prove to the world, to you and to any other false god, that I'm God, is the, the divine apologetic argument for the proof of God being God is I can fulfill prophecy. Fulf uh, 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 fulfilled predictive prophecy is God's way of demonstrating that, that his word is the true word. And in Isaiah 40 to 48, there's a whole long polemic that Isaiah writes about God talking. Jehovah talks to, to Israel about all the false religions that they'd gotten involved in. And he says, the one thing that makes it sure without any doubt that I'm the right one and they're all the wrong, one, wrong ones, bring them into court, let's try the evidence, put some predictive prophecy there, show me where they told you in detail what's going to take place and they made it happen that way, and I'll listen to them because, look, I've done it over and over and over and over again. Did you know when somebody tells you that you can't prove the Bible's the Word of God, they're just speaking out of ignorance? They can have more degrees and they've got temperature, but they're still ignorant of facts about that validate God's Word. And you don't have to validate it out of uh, you know self-validating. It's validated by the science of statistical probability. Did you know we're willing to put people in jail based on DNA evidence? You're willing to say that someone is guilty of murder based on fingerprint evidence? DNA evidence, fingerprint evidence is only uh, the, the, an expression of the science of statistical probabilities. They'll say that it is a probability beyond any question that this is the, that person's identity based on three and six markers of, of, of DNA because they know how to run the statistics. And anything that is 10 to the 46 power, anything that is beyond that is considered to be an absolute impossibility that it wouldn't be true. You can take the statistical, the laws of the science of statistical probability and prove God's word is God's word. Think of how many specific prophecies were fulfilled in the first coming of Jesus Christ. 
You don't have to just do it about him. You can take it in a lot of other things, but just think about that. We just came out of the Christmas season. Everybody's thinking about the baby Jesus. Think of all of the specific, the town he was born in. 700 years before he was born, the town he was born in. His mom and dad didn't live in that town. They lived 100 miles away. His mother's pregnant, going to have a baby within a week, and his daddy's got to get that boy, got to get his wife and move her that way. What would ever allow a husband to do that? I think my wife has three children. We, we had three children. He couldn't put her in the back of a limousine. He had to put her on a donkey or in the back of a cart and drive a pregnant woman 100 miles over rough territory so she could have a baby in a, in, in a town they didn't live in. Why? Because Micah chapter 5 said that's where he had to be born. You say, wow, what's the, what's the probability of that? How many people born in Bethlehem that day? You know, and you just, you say, whoa. So thinking about the future and about those, it, it, it isn't a bad thing. Uh, it, it's just something, but it, most people aren't thinking about it that way. Most people think about the future, you know, just it's kind of a pure in interest. In, in here, in this passage, you, you see some things about exactly what's happening for us. Now, when you get to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, you, you, you're in a context. And by the way, I, I was sitting there thinking a minute ago, I'm, I'm teaching Ephesians in our, in our ministry in Chicago Sunday mornings. I teach Ephesians Sunday morning, Timothy Sunday night, and Hosea Wednesday night. And we've been studying through Ephesians, I think about, I think last Sunday we had our 67th lesson, and we just got to verse number 10 here. And <laughs> I was sitting there thinking, how do you go through these passages, you know, that you take so slowly and, and, and just in an hour like this here? And, and it's not impossible. It's just that there's a whole lot of stuff that, that, that runs through this passage that, that we're going to just kind of skip the surface in, okay? The first thing you have to see when you look at verse number 7, that in the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. When he talks about the ages to come, you have to be sure that you connect that with what's in verse number 11, 12, and 13. Ephesians 2, verse 11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past... Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, but that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye, Gentiles, were without Christ. Why? Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise and having no, uh, no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometime were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So there, there's, there are some timetables there. There's, there's, a, there's a time past and time passed, is, it, and, and the thing that fascinates me about this stuff is that when you start studying about rightly dividing the word of truth, hold your hand with me, come to 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Uh, when you hear preachers say weird things about passages, often if you just read the passage, you can discover what's not weird about it. 2 Timothy 2.15 there's a great argument among, among Bible teachers and uh, among preachers and teachers about what 2 Timothy 2.15 is talking about. And there are a lot of even grace preachers, dispensational preachers, that say 2 Timothy 2.15 is not talking about, about dispensational Bible study. When he says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. They say that's not what that's talking about. And I say, well, that's interesting, but w did you ever read the context? Look at verse 18, 16. Shun profane and vain babblings, for these will increase it a more ungodliness. And the word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander. I, I'm, I'm sorry, and Philetus. Who concerning the truth have erred. Now what did they, how did they err? Well, they didn't rightly divide, so they erred. What was their error? Saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Now, when you overthrow the faith of some, you do what verse 14 is talking about at the end of the verse when it says, but to the subverting of the hearers. So verse 15 is bracketed by the idea of some people subverting the hearers and overthrowing the faith of some, and they did it by saying that the resurrection is past. Now, look at here. If you've got time past, Ephesians 2, verse 11, you've got verse 13, it says, but now... And then verse 7, he talks about the ages to come. Now tell me something. 
What is that? Isn't that past, present, and future? You see, when you study the Bible dispensation, what you're talking about is studying a timeline upon which you place the thing, God's dealings with man. And you recognize that, they, that they've differed through, through history. There is one Lord, but many administrations. God never changes, but his administrations, his dispensations, his dealings, the instructions that he gives to man in different situations do change. Time passed, but now ages to come. You know what 2 Timothy 2.15 is talking about? He's talking about some people that get the information up here in the wrong time place. They didn't deny the resurrection. They didn't say there's no resurrection. You see that? They just said it's past already. In other words, we're no longer in the dispensation of grace because in the dispensation of grace, what ends the dispensation of grace? The rapture, the resurrection, the day of redemption, the adoption. It's what you're looking forward to. Get your new body. <laughs> you glorified body. Go up into the heavens. That ends the, the formation of the body of Christ. They say, that's over. Well, if it's over already, then where are we? We're back in Israel's program. See, that's a dispensational issue. That's what that whole context is about. Time passed, but now the ages to come is the way Paul lays out his understanding of the timeline of the Bible. In time past, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's an issue. Verse 11, verse 12 is a division between the circumcision and the uncircumcision. The circumcision is the nation Israel. The uncircumcision is everybody else. When I was in Sunday school as a kid, you were in Sunday school as a kid, you learned that the Jews were the, you know, the, you know, the children of Israel. And who were the Gentiles? Everybody that wasn't Israel. And you know what that is? That's exactly right. That's what, when you find in your Bible God dealing with man on the basis of that distinction, you're in what Paul calls time past. Then he says, but now that's all changed. Now God has concluded them in unbelief, put them down here with the Gentiles, that he might have mercy on everybody. And then here he's forming the church, the body of Christ. That's going to end, take that out, then he's going to finish the program that he has with Israel back over here, and he's going to complete the program he has with us. What happens in the ages to come is the plan and the purpose that God has back here in time past and the plan and purpose that he has here in the body of Christ where we are, that's the time when these things are going to be brought to fruition. Both plans, both purposes. Okay. Now, we talk about that. I look around the crowd, and I know most of you, and I know most of you understand these things. People tell me they watch the TV program. People call me, they, they call our office and say, we don't talk to the chalkboard man. <laughs> and I draw on the chalkboard on the TV program a lot. But I draw that chart about 80% of the time because that's the thing that the people watching need to see because it changes your understanding, opens your perspective about God, what God's Word is. Okay, I want to spend some time with you tonight and the next time, not just on the basic basics of that, I really want to spend some time about what's going to be going on in the ages to come out here. Okay, But we've got to start by understanding what the focus is. Back here in time past, God gave these people a hope. The hope that they had back here in time past had to do with there's a time of wrath that's going to fall on the nation Israel. The Messiah is going to come and redeem them. He's going to set up his kingdom out here on the earth, headed at Jerusalem, and the salvation of God's going to go to the nations out here. That kingdom, that kingdom program, that kingdom on the earth, the kingdom of heaven it's called, that kingdom over here is the hope of people back in time past. Someone asked me the other day about, about heaven, you know, the kingdom of heaven. Deuteronomy 11.22 describes that kingdom as the days of heaven on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay. So when you go back here in your Old Testament, that's the hope back there that these people had. When, the, when John the Baptist came in Matthew chapter number 3, book of Mark, book of Luke, book of John, the earthly ministry of Christ, he came preaching to Israel, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They needed to repent, change their thinking about breaking the, God's covenant, about not being who God intended them to be, and prepare the way for the Messiah. Look at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 
Matthew chapter 3, verse number 12, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They knew what that kingdom was because they had all the Old Testament prophets tell them what it was. They knew it was a literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic kingdom with the, with the headquarters in Jerusalem with the nation Israel reigning. They knew that. That's what all that Old Testament prophecies had told them. John the Baptist, after 400 years of silence, God says, I'm going to speak again. John comes and says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is hand. He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the path of the Lord, the way of the Lord. Verse 3 says that, for this is he that spoken, uh, spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John was had, had his raiment of, uh, of camel's hair and a, a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. <laughs> Give me Dr. Pepper any time. <laughs> he's dressed like that because he's coming in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Okay? Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. All that Israel that heard him, the nation Israel in here, he preaches to them. And when, when those apostate Jews, those uh, Israel out here, when they believe that message, they come in here and they're baptized by John and they identify themselves as a part of that little flock. If you're not little flock, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And what John the Baptist is doing is he's forming that believing remnant in the nation Israel who are going to trust their Messiah. The law and the prophets were something extremely important happened in the life of Israel dispensationally with the beginning of John the Baptist. Luke 16, 16 says that the law and the prophets were until John. That's all they had. But with John, the kingdom of God began to be preached. And all men press into it. Now the issue becomes the kingdom is at hand. A new issue. And when you come into the book of Matthew with John, uh, with John the Baptist, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but especially the book of Matthew, a tremendous transition is, is taking place because now things that have just been in prospect are here available at hand. Now, verse, that's why he says, that, that's why they go out. They're baptized of John. Why would he baptize them? John is a priest. His daddy was of the, of the tribe of Levi. His mom was of the tribe of the Levi. He's 30 years old. He's beginning his ministry. Where should he be? He should be up at the temple being ordained into the priesthood. He's not. He's out. He looks like Elijah out on the Jordan River. But he's doing what you do to a priest when you ordain him into the priesthood. Exodus 29, what John should have been done is up there at, that, at the temple being washed with water anointed with oil, and sprinkled in the ceremony that hallowed him for the priest office. He's out here gathering a remnant out of the nation to do the same because the nation is going to be a kingdom. We didn't read it, Exodus 19, a kingdom of priests. He's gathering together that believing remnant to whom the Lord's going to give the kingdom. Now look at verse 7. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, that's this, this crowd out here that is the, 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 the leaders of the apostate part of the nation. When he sees the scribes and Pharisees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, that's not a compliment. Now when you read in the Bible, O generation, that's not talking about a time period. People make a real mistake when they go over to Matthew 24 and when Jesus says that uh, this generation shall not pass until these things be, be accomplished. And they say, well, okay, now we've got to figure, is that generation 70 years, 100 years, 30 years, how long? It's not, in the, when he talks about a generation of vipers, he's not talking about how old they are. He's talking about where they came from. To generate something is to give birth to it. Oh, John, he's saying what he so, tell them in John 8, your father is of the devil. You know where this crowd came from? That's Satan's generation. 
That's a generation of vipers. Who's the viper? Who's the snake? Who's the poisonous snake? The one with poison in his lips back in the Psalms. Well, that Psalm that says that's talking about the Antichrist. Here's the crowd that's going to bring the Antichrist in, Satan's crowd. He says, who hath warned you, watch, to flee from what? The wrath to come. It's right out there. They know that there's some wrath. If you look at verse number 11, I, I love this verse. Get this one. I indeed baptize, uh, well, you just skip down to verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water and repentance. He that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to, to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There's three baptisms in one verse. And they're all different. Now, how would you how do you how do you take that verse and put Ephesians 4 or 5 with that one to make any sense? When he says there's one baptism. See, he's not saying there's one only one baptism in the Bible. Because there's three right there. And there's at least, you know, eight or nine more that aren't in that verse. So what's he talking about when he says there's only one Lord, one faith, one baptism? Well, he isn't talking about that uh, there's only one in the Bible. Well, you know what he's talking about. Well, if you don't, think about it. <laughs> but see, that, that that's what people do. They say, well, somebody's telling me today about getting people getting mad at them because they're saying there's, only, there's more than one gospel in the Bible. Ooh, got, got kicked out of a preaching place. There's only one gospel. You've got to be blind in one eye and can't see out of the other to say there's only one gospel in the Bible. What they meant to say was well, there's only one gospel today. Now, that's true. But if you don't know how to rightly divide the Bible and you think all the Bible is today, what do you do? Well, you live in confusion and you trouble people. Verse number 12 is where I wanted to go. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. So the Messiah's got his fan in his hand. <laughs> he's going to purge. He's going to clean it. He, this is going to be a time of purging out of the rebel from Israel. And he's going to gather up the chaff. That's the stuff that this is no good. You ever eat peanuts and it's got the little, take, take the shell and it's got the little brown wrapper on it? You, Get that off, blow it away, and eat the, eat the hus eat get the husk out and eat the, the meat. That's the chaff. And what do you do with it? You just go <laughs> blow it away. You go down to Five Guys and you get all them peanuts, you know, and, and, and do you know get a lot on the table and yeah, you, you love to go there because you put them in the floor, you know. <laughs> but you you gotta and you do it like that and the peanuts go all off and then you eat the peanut. He said, I'm gonna burn up that chaff with unquenchable fire. That's what that is. That fire is right there. Judgment. And then I'm going to gather the wheat into the garment. I'm going to bring them in here, plant them. They're going to grow the kingdom. They know this king age is to come for them. They got that. This stuff back here, prophecy, in your Bible, the topic of your Bible from Genesis chapter 1 all the way through over here to Acts Stephen in Acts chapter number 7, you got the cross work in here. Jesus dies, ascends into heaven. The Holy Spirit comes in the day of Pentecost in the book of Acts here. And from Acts 2 to Acts 7, that is, that's the issue. By the way, Hebrews chapter number 2, just in case you have a problem with the idea that the, the, the dispensation of grace did not begin in, on the day of Pentecost, where everybody says it is. If everybody says it is, almost, almost instinctively you know there's a problem. You know, now everybody didn't say it is. I'm, I read a guy the other day, big famous Baptist preacher, says start with Abraham. You know, I got a book at home, where written by another Baptist preacher that says the you know the Baptist church started with John the Baptist. Well, I, he's probably right about that, but the body of Christ didn't start at the day of Pentecost. People go, oh, oh, oh. Had, a, had a Baptist preacher call me, oh, three weeks ago. And uh, he said, Brother Jordan, I want you to know that this, 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 this message has completely changed my life. It's opened my eyes. I see it. You know, I call those, I, and I see it call. You ever get one of those? 
I see it. I see it. He, he said, I don't know how to say it. And he says, I, I always thought the New Testament church was birthed at Pentecost. He didn't even know terminology to not to use yet. I'll give him some time. He'll get it. But he said, I got it. I got it. And I thought, well, praise the Lord. And he called me because we'd, we'd been, our office had been communicating with him. He said, I want you to come down here and preach this to my church because they're getting it. And I said, which Sunday, the next one or the next one? <laughs> Let's go. So we scheduled a meeting in March. And I think, well, all right. Good for in fact, I, I, I tell you, I've got two meetings, one, one in that church and then one in another Baptist church in the next three months of pastors who've come to see through the TV, through, the t t to the, through people just witnessing, sharing. I, I say that so that you understand truth does matter to people. You say, well, I talk to people and they don't want it. You know what the answer to that is? Next. I mean, the, the, the next guy might be this, you know, he might, might, might be Brother Frank that says, I got to get I got this. You know why he did it? Because somebody said, next, I talked to him, and, and he got it. You're sitting over there beating your head silly against the wall because the people you talk to won't listen to you. Lift up your eyes and go out and find somebody else to talk to. Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, it's fun. <laughs> anyway, verse number 12, and he, 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 he should gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That prophetic program that's back there, uh, by the way, I was going to show you Hebrews 2. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Hebrews chapter 2. I knew I'd lost it. I just didn't know where it went. Yeah. That, that's one of the, th that's probably after the surgery that I had and the, the blood stuff, probably the single most frustrating thing for me personally, I'll be personal here, is that all the time I had that, the, the, was taking that, that blood infect, that, uh, for the medicine for the blood infection, it was like you lived in a, in a fog. You could walk around, but you know when you're in a fog, you, you can only see about four feet. You walk real fast, you run into the wall. So you walk slow, and you're looking, and you say, I can't, I can't make it out. And then after I got off the stuff, two days, uh, last dose was on Thursday, on, by, on Saturday, it was like the sun came out, and the fog lifted. But it didn't go but about halfway across the room. But I got a bigger room. And then slowly it began to, you know, regress out. And for me that fog was, what is your name? I know your face. Nobody could forget that. But I can't. And it was, oh, and then it would come. And I was always used to my brain thinking about five words that my mouth couldn't say fast enough. But then I'm going, now my mouth is saying, okay, come on, give me another word. And so it was kind of a slow process. Folks at church thought it was wonderful. I went seven weeks, first time in my adult life that I ever went seven weeks without preaching. I'd never done that before as an adult. So when I got back in the pulpit, I was there one week and I got the blood infection. I'm out another little while. I come back, I, I'm talking real slow. Because my brain didn't feed in the words at 70 miles an hour, you know. I was going about 30 miles an hour with the gusts up to 40 every now and every not And, and now that's moving away. But every now and then what happens is I'm talking and, oh, okay. <laughs> so if I do that for you, it's not because, you know, of you. It's, it's my, it's, it's about 85% better. And. I'm assuming this is about the way it's going to be. Hebrews chapter 2. That, that was a commercial. That was just for sympathy. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 3. How should we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Now, now Hebrews, we're over here, okay, in these books. Hebrews 2, verse number 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by our Lord? That's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What salvation did he preach about back here? He preached the gospel of the kingdom that had to do with these people here, this little flock, inheriting that kingdom. Okay? 
The good news of how not to be burned up in the in the wrath, wrath is chaff, but to be gathered into the kingdom. How shall we escape if we neglect this so great salvation began to be spoken by our Lord and was confirmed unto us, watch now, by them that heard him. Now when was that? Verse 4. God also bearing them witness, them that heard him, both with signs and wonders and divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost. When did the Holy Spirit come? They have Pentecost. So I know something. When he says it was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, that's after Pentecost. It's confirmed. You see that? What were the what were they confirming? At, what were the Pentecostal preachers confirming? Not something new that nobody ever knew about. They're confirming what Christ taught them back here. You see that? I'm not sure you do. You're not going woohoo. <laughs> You're going, oh, Brother Rick. That is a startling verse. And it gets better, verse number, the verse number next. For unto the angels hath he not put into subjection, what? The world to come. Where would that go? Right out there. Now finish that verse. Whereof we, what does the writer of the book of Hebrews think he's talking about? He thinks he's talking about he doesn't think. He says he's talking about that. Okay? All right. That verse told me two things, at least. One, Pentecost was nothing new. It's a continuation of, of the ministry of, that Christ trained his apostles to carry on in his absence. And it's about the ages to come. Now, there are three great transition books in your New Testament. The book of Matthew brings you out of the Law and the Prophets, introduces you to John and the preaching of the kingdom of God. The book of Acts, you have a transition between the, pre the, the, the kingdom message and the new program between prophecy and mystery because the Lord Jesus Christ inter interrupts prophecy and introduces the, the program that Paul calls the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery with the raising salvation and commission of the apostle Paul here. You read that in Romans through Philemon and that ministry. So you have Matthew, Acts, the transition into us, and then the book of Hebrews is a transition back into Israel's program where, you, where they move from the Old Testament to the New Testament. The whole purpose in the book of Hebrews is to say, look, you guys don't go back to the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, go on to the New Covenant, the Messianic Covenant. Okay? It's critical to get that. And that's why people get so screwed up by taking verses out of Matthew, Acts, and Hebrews to try to be their salvation verses, their Christian life verses, because in those books everything is in movement. Hebrews through Revelation are going to fit right over there in that doctrine, but this is going to be doctrine. I can't write. It's another skill I lost. This is going to be doctrine in connection with prophecy. Now, when you come into the mystery program where we are and the dispensation of grace begins with Paul, comes in through here, that's found in Romans to Philemon. Our past, present, and future, it's not going to be over there, it's over here. If you're looking for instruction about the ages to come for you, you look in here, not over there. That's what I'm trying to get to. Follow me? So we're going to have to go into here and find out about the ages to come for us. You with me? All right. Come back to Ephesians 2. Because there's some things about this I'd like to be able to communicate with you, to you, frankly, that, that we haven't, I had never, and I've never heard anybody else really, thought about very thoroughly. We talk about it. There's some terms we throw out, but there's some thinking about these terms that uh, I, I think we need to kind of pursue a little bit. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 now, verse 1. And you, by the way, see that and? And you, hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. That and you is, is sort of like, and you. <laughs> and it comes off of what he just said in chapter 1. If you go back to verse 22. 
and hath made and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. He's concluding a a a a, a prayer here, where he's, he if you go back verse verse uh, seventeen. Paul's prayer that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know. That you may, uh, may know. There's some things he wants them to know. Okay. Now, when he says in verse 17 that he would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, there's a big argument. People, people argue... Is he saying, give you the Holy Spirit? Well, if you look at verse 13, you see they already have the Holy Spirit. So when he says, give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, he's not talking about giving them the Holy Spirit. They already have him. They don't, you don't get more of the Holy Spirit after you get saved. Okay? When he says this, he would give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation, that word spirit there is not a reference to the Holy Spirit. It's a reference to a disposition, an attitude, a thinking process. The spirit of slumber. A term like that? Okay, I'm, I'm going to go with a bunch of that. But I just want you to understand, the, the if you, you look at the verses where he talks about uh, the spirit of something, uh, the, the, the spirit of meekness and, 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 and that kind of thing, th those are... That's the idea uh, uh, about what that, that the, the, the Spirit is there. It's not, he's not talking about giving them the Holy Spirit. He's talking about giving them a disposition, an attitude that comes from wisdom and revelation that God has given us through the mystery. There is a thinking process that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened that would give you a way of thinking that you may know, not just be aware of, but really know. That word know is a great word. Uh, it first occurs in Genesis chapter 4 when Adam knew his wife Eve and they conceived and had a son. Hi, I'm Richard. Hi, Eve. No, I don't have that. <laughs> That's Steve. <laughs> When that verse says he knew Eve, he wasn't talking about just how, how you do it. As Galen Radio would say, he said he knew her in the biblical sense. It's talking about an intimacy. The word intimacy means into me see. I have a knowledge of you that is thorough. You know what eternal life is, John 7? Verse 3, Jesus said that they might know you, that they might have eternal, which is to know you and him who's thy son. Eternal life is not just living forever because you're going to do that anyway. It's to know the Father. Not just, hi, how are you? It's to have an into me see relationship with the Father where you share his life. Paul said, I want, to, I want this stuff to get a grip on you. I want you to have the spirit that he would grant you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, not of you, of him. This ain't about you. That's a revelation. Somebody says, well, I go to church down there and I don't get anything out of it. Well, bless your heart, it ain't about you getting something out of it. It's about him. Probably if you aren't getting anything out of it, it's because him isn't there. Well, I don't mean he isn't there. He hasn't been put out too much. If him is being put out, preached, and you aren't getting anything, well, maybe that problem's on you then. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, <coughs> that you may know. And one of the things he wants you to know is the exceeding greatness of his power to us when he raised Christ from the dead, verse 20, and when he set him in his own right hand in heavenly places. So he says he took Jesus Christ and he raised him from the dead, and then he set him in his own right hand up here in, the, in heavenly places. And I want you to understand the power that was involved in him doing that. And if you can understand the power of him doing that, and what it means for him to be seated at the Father's right hand as the, as the head of all of the government of the universe, the rightful king of all, 
verse 22, he put all things under his feet when he sat him right there. And he made him to be head over all things to the church. That verse doesn't say he made him head over everything in your life. Sorry. It said he made him head over all those principalities and powers in verses 20 and 21. Colossians 2, verse 9, he says, For in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth bodily. <clears throat> we are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You know why he made you complete? In, isn't it wonderful to be complete in Christ? I spend probably two-thirds of my ministry trying to convince people that that's true. You know, religion just doesn't want you to be complete in Christ. It doesn't want him to be enough. It doesn't. We're going to talk about why that is in a, few, in a couple, I hope in a couple, in, in, in a little while. The devil doesn't want you to appreciate it. The adversary doesn't want you to appreciate that he's enough. Why? You're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. You know why? That completeness that he gave you in him is the thing that he's going to replace all of that host up there with and going to put you and me in the positions of being a part of, being, being in the reigning, the reclaiming, the restitution of all those things back into the headship of Jesus Christ. If I was the adversary, I wouldn't like that either. So he comes down to verse 22, and he says, He's put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Now, this is the first time in Ephesians he's mentioned the church. So notice how he defines the church, verse 23. Which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church today is described, one of the ways, is described in about a half a dozen ways in Ephesians, but one, the first one, is body. Now that's a metaphor, of course, figure of speech to tell you the relationship you have with him. Your body has a function. You have a spirit, a soul, your inner man, and it's in a body. It's an earthly house of this tabernacle. Okay? Your body is the vehicle in which your inner man lives and is carried around from place to place. For my inner man to have gotten here to, to, in, in, in Florida, I had to get on an airplane yesterday and fly my body down here. Why? Because my inner man lives in my body. And if my inner man lives, if my soul and my spirit leave my body, they don't come to Orlando. They go to, they go to be with the Lord. But what my body does is the expression of that what the inner man decides to do. Your body is a vehicle that the life inside of it lives out through. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the heart are the issues of life. All of the issues in your life come out of your inner man. You with me? You know where sin comes from? It's not where your hand goes. It's not be careful little eyes what you see. I'm not discounting that because your eye gates are gate to put stuff in, in your inner man. It's not be careful little feet where you go. It has to do with be careful what that guy inside of you decides to see, look at, and have your feet do. Job said, I made a covenant with my eyes that I wouldn't look on a maid. You know what he did? He said, I'm, I, I made a covenant with my heart that I wasn't going to think thoughts in my heart. That God says aren't mine to think. You want to stay out of trouble? That's a good thing to do. I had a family just this recently bring a 14 year old boy, sit him down. Little boy's in jail tonight for some terrible, terrible crime. 
the boy's mama had to take him to the police department and say, my son's done these things. You have to have him. What a heartache that is. They come to me and say, what do we do? I said, well, first thing, you take him down here with his sister Carmen. The little boy got into all, 14 years old, got into that because he's watching videos, he's sucking up stuff on the Internet that's filled his heart with rage and filth and ungodliness and sin. And when your heart's filled with it, and there your little brother and your little sister are, you know what you do? You say, by the way, this little boy's granddaddy's a preacher. His uncle's a preacher. Nobody you're going to know is that. Or not in my church, my kind. Where'd it come from? That, that little, they can put that little boy in a cage and stop his body. They can't stop his sin. Because that comes from somewhere else. You follow? You understand what I'm saying? Your body is used to express, well, it expresses the, so if you're the body of Christ, what's your purpose? To live a nice, sweet, calm, comfortable, influential life and be patted on the back, big fish in a small pond? No, your purpose is to express his life. Is that a high calling or, or not? He's going to take this body and out there in the ages to come show forth the exceeding riches of his grace. Okay? That in the ages to come he might show forth the exceeding of the riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. We're his body. His life is going to manifest itself out through us. Be put on open display for the whole universe right out there. That's the purpose of the body. Not to form a, a religion, a religious system. Not to build an empire and a kingdom. That's the reason in the Bible there's not any organization at all in Scripture and Paul's epistles ever seen or authorized or suggested outside of a, beyond a local church. That's why a local church is what he tells you to do. You can't do the work of the ministry without a, without a local church. A local church is simply a group of saints gathered together in a locality, banded together to do the work of the ministry. Perfected saints are to do what? The work of the ministry. You do the work of the ministry, you see the body of Christ edified. Nothing in there about building systems and kingdoms and programs and big ones and little ones and all the rest of it. It's just about getting on with what God's doing where you are. It's life. And as you do that, I've told many of you, you know, so if we don't have a grace church where I live, and you know what I'm going to say, don't you? Go out in front of your house, stand in the front front yard, stand at the side, uh, you know, look around, take a picture, notice the address, and put it in the newspaper. So that's the address of the local Grace Church. <laughs> Not that hard. You don't need me to come and commission you. You're already commissioned. You don't need me to authorize you. You're already authorized. You just need to get on with it. You need to become a perfected saint so you can do the work of the ministry. Don't get ahead of yourself. But don't sit there and not have a reason for, anyway, you got it. The body of Christ. Now, the reason I'm, I'm trying to emphasize that is verse, chapter 2, verse 1. And you, look at who he's going to make this body of people out of. You who were, you have the quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sin. That didn't, even, that didn't even, you know what your problem was? You were dead. You were real stinkers. Cut off. Hey, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power. You see there when he talks about time past, somebody asked me every now and then, well, what if verse 11 talks about time past and it's a dispensational thing, and then over here, this but now is a dispensational thing. What's verse? Verse 1 is individual. Listen, this dispensational change in here where you, for the body, dispensation of grace, won't do you any good if you don't get saved. If you don't become individually a part, of, if you don't have a personal but now, 
you got a personal time past. You need a personal but now. That's why Colossians 2 verse 13 identifies Ephesians 2 in two phrases. You who were dead in sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Dead in sins, the first ten verses, uncircumcision of your flesh, verse 11 to the end of the chapter. A personal predicament and a dispensational predicament. Until the dispensational predicament was changed, you couldn't personally get any, any, anything. But now that it is, you can personally have your... And you know who he's making, up, making his body up of? Man, we are some bad raw material. When in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works within children of disobedience, among whom also you had all of our, we all had our conversation in time past, the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Oh, that don't sound like it's good. Lost. Dead. Dominated. Driven by the adversary. Driven by, by deceitful lust. Hating and hating, hateful, hating one another. Verse over in Titus, he talks about deceiving and being deceived. Lost, we just lost. You say, "Whoa, wait a minute." <laughs> He's gonna build this thing out of this. This thing, he go over here and go, go right down into the mire. Bunch of old lost, hell-bound Gentiles deserve nothing but God. But God, you can't get saved till you get lost. You go out and preach about the grace of God and the love of God in Christ. And people will say to you, I know because they say it to me, that's just this new age positive thinking. Now that's nonsense. Because the grace of the new age positive thinking never takes into account sin and failure. The cross is all about taking in, in account sin and failure. The grace of God is all about taking care of sin and failure. The positive is built on eliminating the negative, not ignoring it, but being just and the justifier of them that believe in Jesus. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherein he hath loved us. Have you ever just relaxed and appreciated how much God loves you? Oh, you need to sit down sometime and just relax. Get over your religion. Get over yourself. Get over the push and the shove and the treadmill and just say, thank you, Lord, for loving me so much. A man wrote me a note recently. He said, you know, Jesus is an overpayment for our sins. And I thought, you know, he's right. I'm going to steal that quote. I can, give it, I can give him credit for it, but he's an over. That's why Paul says, being justified, much more. That's why he says, verse 7, the exceeding riches. I mean, I think about that, and my heart goes, woo-hoo-hoo-hoo-hoo. And over... You know how valuable you are to God? Do you appreciate how much he loves his son? Jesus Christ is the most precious person there is to God the Father. The apple of his eye. The joy of his heart. The altogether lovely. The one in whom he has all preeminence. And he gave him up for you. And you're trying to do something to impress God. Ooh. Now, verse 5, you've got to follow this. Even when we were dead in sins, verse 1 and 2, hath quickened us together with Christ, that by grace you're saved. Now, you see the little parenthesis, by grace you're saved? I don't know if you ever thought about why is that in that verse. But it's, a, it's in that verse because he starts, he says... And you hath he quickened. What happened to you before he quickened you? The quickening 
is, is being made alive, being resurrect, be, be, getting his resurrection life. But what happened to you before you were raised with him? You were, you were, you were crucified with him, weren't you? You died with him. You notice Ephesians doesn't list that? Where do you find about that? Romans. Ephesians is an advancement on the book of Romans. Romans talks about your, 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 your don't you know, I mean, it's baptized in Jesus Christ. You're, you died with him, crucified with him. You were buried with him. You were raised with him. The book of Romans teaches you about the grace of God providing everything you will ever need as a member, as a saint of the Most High God in the body of Christ to live successfully on planet Earth as a member of his body. He took you, he crucified your old man, he put the life of Jesus Christ into you, and now you're to reckon yourself to be dead indeed in the sin. That isn't the issue anymore, but alive unto God. Christ in you, the hope of glory is the issue. Not what you did, but what he did. Not your obedience, but his obedience. As you go through life, you learn you, you learn verses that you thought you knew, that you had them backwards. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, verse 5, rolled me out of bed one day. I'm laying there in the bed thinking about it, and it dawned on me. I just, it looked like, just, like the roof fell on me. I said, I've been teaching that verse backwards all these years. Shame on me. Now, this happened several years ago. I've been trying to correct it. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. You know the verse. And bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Go out and take all of your thinking and growl them up and grab them up and make them obey Christ. You ever tried that? How'd that work out? It don't work so well. So I, I used to teach people, well, you need to renew your mind. I come up with, I'm reading that, I, I wasn't even reading that verse. I was reading Romans, 5, Romans 5 when it hit me. It doesn't say make bring every thought into captivity to, the obedient, to obedience to Christ. It said the obedience of Christ. What's that? Philippians 2, he says he was obedient unto death, even... He was obedient. Romans 5 says it's by one man's disobedience many are made sinners. By the obedience of one many are made righteous. Who's obedient? What is, what is the obedience of Christ? He's obedient unto death, even to the death of the cross. Do you know what I need to do? I need to bring my thinking under the control of the fact that Jesus Christ's life is the issue, not mine. His merit, his obedience, what he's... Lord, I can't do this. I, I'm unway... Me... Not me, you, but you can. Here's what your word says about this situation. I can't, but you can. You're obedient. You can. The life that not I live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You follow that? That's a commercial, but man, that's, that's a life changer. You see, being a grace believer isn't just being a mid acts dispensationalist. Being a grace believer says, I'm not living under a performance system in my Christian life and my walk with God. I'm living in light of the fact that I am dead to sin and alive unto God. Now, when you've got that, and until you've got that, you don't belong in, in Ephesians. In the terms of 1 Corinthians 3, you're not able to bear this. You've got people over here trying to learn and rejoice in Ephesians that have no business over here. Just like Paul said, I wouldn't teach this stuff to you Corinthians because you can't bear it. You need to get back over here at the cross and learn about your death, burial, and resurrection with Jesus Christ and that he's your life, not you. I'm just saying. Ephesians says to the saints, and faithful people who fit in the 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6 and following category. We speak these truths among them that are perfect. Growing up. When he says, by grace you're saved, he's alerting you to the fact that you need to go back and remember the grace orientation that you learned in the book of Romans. There's a lot of stuff, especially in the first uh, seven verses of chapter 1, 
almost everything he, in fact, everything he mentions in Romans chapter, Ephesians 1, verse, verse 4, 5, 6, and 7, is stuff that he expected them already to know because it was taught to them thoroughly in the book of Romans. Then he's going to build on that, the stuff in Ephesians verse, chapter 1, verse 8 and following. Here he's building on it. He said, you know who you are? And he reaches back and he takes the, take, starts you right here because this is, by the way, have you ever said, I know I'm dead to sin but alive unto God, but it don't work? Sure you have. People tell me that. Oh, Brother Rick, it just isn't working for me. I got this sin. I just can't quit. I just can't quit getting mad. It just swells up and comes up. You know why you get mad? Pride. No, I got mad because she said, oh, no, you didn't. I got mad because he didn't do it. No, you didn't. You got mad because of pride. And you said, what psychology book did you get that out of? Proverbs 13, verse 10. Go home, read it, and choke on it. Dead to sin, like I'm quickened. Now, the focus now isn't simply back over here and how you've been equipped to live on planet Earth for His glory. The focus now is going to be on what's He going to do with you after you, you got, okay? He quickened us. By grace you're saved. Don't forget how you got there. It was by dying with Him, bearing with Him. And hath raised us up together. That's the ascension. And made us sit together In heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. You go back to chapter 1, verse 20, and you'll see that. You and I literally have been put in a position to share the authority of Jesus Christ as he sits as the head of all principality and power. That verse is not talking about you're down here, and he's sitting up there, and you're up there, and you're down here, and you're two places at once, because you can't be in two places at once. Jesus could, John 3, 13, but you can't because you're not God. That verse is talking about you, when you sit together with him, what's he sitting at? He's sitting as the head of all these principalities and powers, and you sit together with him. You share his authority in the government of the heavens. That's what he formed the body for. So he'd have a group of people to go up here and fill all that fullness with himself. With his life manifested in and through you who used to be that bunch of dudes in verse 1, 2, and 3. It takes the grace of God to do that. Grace is all that God's free to do for you through the finished work of Christ. Now, why did he do all of that? That, in the ages to come, here's our future, he might show forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Jesus Christ. He's going to make known. When that says going to manifest. That means he's going to make known. He's going to put it on display. Reveal it and lay it out there so everybody can see it. Come with me. If you, I'll, I'll use an illustration. Come with me to Romans chapter 1. And before you get that, come with me to Acts chapter 3. <clears throat> Acts 3 verse number 20. Peter's talking, and he says, And that he should shall send Jesus Christ, which before is preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive, until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Notice that expression, the restitution of all things. What, God, what Christ is going to do back here is he's going to restore something. He's going to restore something his original plan that he had in creation back here. When he originally created the earth back here, he had a plan. And what's going to happen over here, he's going to restore 
that plan. Put it back into operation in his universe. Now, in prophecy, they only know about the fact that he's going to do it in the earth. We now know that he's also going to do it in the heavens. You see, if you understand that difference, then you understand why it's not necessary for you to try to push yourself into, these, into this stuff. It's okay to let them have it. In fact, it's fun to study it and know what he's going to do with them. I'm as nosy as you are. But I don't want to think it's me when i got something else to do. Okay? Romans chapter 1. I just want you to see an illustration. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Notice that idea about they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Now, if you go back to verse 20, you see what this, verse 19, you see what it's talking about. And, and by the way, th this, is, this passage is describing, uh, y there's a wonderful phrase that uh, Pastor Stam used when he described this passage. I, when I worked with him, he was, wrote his commentary on Romans, and we talked about this passage, and, and he had a little phrase, and I told him, you've got to use that as the heading. <laughs> now, you didn't mean, need me to tell him that, but he says, how the heathen got that way. And I, I, when I, I said, that's exact. You couldn't put a better caption on this passage. This is how the heathen, you, me, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. How did we get that way? Verse, verse 18, verse 19. Because that which may be known of God was manifest in them. For God has showed it unto them. God indelibly wrote into the heart of, every cre of, of, of Adam when he wrote it that I'm God. God's there. He put it in the nature, the makeup, so they knew him. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. Every person born on the human race that has, has rationality knows, one, there's a God, and knows, two, they're going to face him in judgment. They know his eternal power and his Godhead. They know those things. Why? I can tell you that. I don't have to have anybody argue with me because everybody knows they know that. You have to be educated out of knowing that. That's why people get educated so they can't, so they can get out of doing it. They get educated so that they cannot retain what they know by nature. Now, all that stuff in verse 21 and following on down to verse 27 is done. All that thing about uh, verse 21, because they knew God, they, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. The professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, changing the glory of God and under corrupt. They did all of that for one purpose. So they didn't have to retain the knowledge of God. He put it in them. It's there. They don't want it, so they talk themselves out of believing it and, and, and retaining that knowledge. So they don't talk to God to their children about God. You know, mister, you have a responsibility in your home as the, as the head of your... I was talking to people just yesterday about marriage couple going to get married in a couple of weeks, a couple of months. Are we talking about it? Talking about the ceremony. And I told, I told the, the, the girl, I said, the most important point in that ceremony for you is when your daddy walks you down that aisle and I say, who gives this, man, this woman to be married to this man? And he says, I do. Not her mother and I, I do. Because you're transferring his headship over you to his headship. Marriage is a headship issue. It ain't a, oh, I love them and can't live without them, and when they walk out of the room, it sucks the air out of the room. It isn't in that kind of gobbledygook. It, that's nice to have there. It's better to have that than not to have it. But marriage is a headship issue. That woman has a head over her in the Bible. See, 
you're so far away from the Bible, you think I'm talking, you know what I'm talking about. Probably ten of you couldn't, probably only ten of you could even find the verses. You've been married 40 years. Oh, yeah. I'm, look, I've been pastoring four decades. I've been around this stuff. I've been married for almost five decades. I, I know some of this stuff, practically speaking. Mister, you have, you're responsible for your family, for your wife. If there's a problem in your home, it's your problem. You might not have caused it. It's yours to deal with. I see problems in the, in the homes and dads are going, <laughs> absent. You know what it does? It leaves mama to say, wait a minute, mama will become mama bear over her little cubs. But it ain't hers to fix, it's yours. And the abdication of, of that headship in, in marriages destroys the home. I'm preaching now. I'm not preaching the passage, but I can't help but make the point because a bunch of you are It's your responsibility to teach your children that book. It's not my job. It's not the church's job. It's not your Sunday school teacher's job. It's your job. My job is to help you do your job. Happy to do it. You're welcome. But that's my job is to help you, not do it for you. It's your job to train. Fathers, bring up your children. Don't send them. Bring them. Nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's important. I can't even remember how I got under this, but it's so good I'll just stay here. <laughs> you need to appreciate that and understand that issue of responsibility because it's going to be that word that works. And if if you let all that garbage of the world in there and they don't, there's no verses, that no truth that the Holy Spirit can take in their hearts and bring to their conscience, how do you expect God to work in them? Oh, I know what you want to do. You want to go back over to Pentecost and say, come over here, Lord, just fix it for me. He don't do that. He didn't do that back then. He sure don't do it today. You've got some glorified superstitious idea about God's going to come along and rescue you from all your stupidity. He's already rescued you from it. And what you need is your faith to believe it. And when you believe it, it'll work. Okay, I'm sorry. They don't like to retain the knowledge of God. They did all that stuff in those verses in between there. The whole purpose of all that stuff in Romans 1 the adversary doesn't want you thinking about God. Don't talk to God about you. Don't talk to your kids about God. That's how I got into it. I tell you I'd remember. Don't talk to about God in your family. Don't talk to God in your culture. So what happened in the 60s? They said you can't read the Bible in schools anymore. Listen, that wasn't where you're supposed to read the Bible anyway. What they were talking about is what they're talking about now. They were just doing it so that now you can't even talk about God. The God of the Bible. You can talk about Allah, but you can't talk about the God of the Bible. But Allah's not God anyway, so who cares? We don't want to. We we don't want it. About three years ago, I sat. I've told you before. I sat with a young man, thirty years old, graduate of law school in Chicago, graduate of a prestigious uh, uh, undergraduate work in, in a real prestigious school. A member of a of a top tier Chicago law firm, we sat and talked for an hour and a half, and we got talking about the the Good Samaritan law. He didn't know the Good Samaritan law came from the parable of the Good Samaritan. He'd never heard of the parable of the Good Samaritan. How in the world can you be educated in America and 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 not know what the parable of the Good Samaritan is? You don't have to believe the Bible if you don't even know the the the, the metaphors that carry the value of your culture. You're not educated. I asked him, you know who David and Goliath were? He said, That's, that, that was, uh, he shoot somebody with a BB gun? You know where he got it? He got off a cartoon. I said, no, that came from a parable out of the Bible that Jesus told. He says, oh, no, it can't be. I said, well, it is. He said, that'd be separation of church and state. Wouldn't let them do that.
Satan knew if I just get them not to retain, they got it, but don't retain the knowledge of God. That's his goal. That's why you go back to verse 25, who changed the truth of God into a lie. How do you know God? You know him through his word. You know him through thy, thy word, sanctify them by thy truth, thy word is truth. If you don't have his word, you can't know him. That's how you know me, how I know you. We talk to one another. We communicate to one another. Our words make ourselves known. And Satan knew that he couldn't kill God, so he tried to make it so that no one would retain the knowledge of God in their thinking. They wouldn't re re retain that knowledge. They wouldn't talk about it. wouldn't think about it. They wouldn't act, act in a way that, he, that he, as though he were there. They would just forget the concept altogether. And that's how he was going to take possession of the earth. Get rid of God and make him God. When you worship, verse 25, if you worship and serve the creature more than the creator, who are you worshiping? Well, you're the creature. And when you worship yourself rather than God, you're doing exactly what your father the devil did. You with me? That's the lie program, deification of the creature. But who's the ultimate creature to deify? Who did you just get rid of? <laughs> you got rid of God. He doesn't care who you substitute him with because as soon as you got rid of him, that's what he, because then I can win because my program just won because my program is getting rid of God's authority. Now, when you come to the kingdom over here, what's going to happen? Isaiah chapter 11, verse 9 says, in that, in that kingdom, the knowledge of God is going to cover the face of the earth as the water covers the sea. You know how he's going to take back his authority in the earth? I just told you. The knowledge of God. How's the knowledge of God going to go out? The nation Israel. I mean, I'm just quoting these verses. Do we need to look at them? Zechariah chapter 8. Ten men out of every language will come take the hold of the skirt of, uh, of a Jew and say, we'll go with you because we've heard that God is with you. Isaiah chapter 2, that out of Jerusalem the word of God will go and all the nations are going to flee into it. I mean, Israel, redeemed Israel, he's going to gather that wheat into the garner, plant them there, and they're going to grow up into this great kingdom that takes God's, the knowledge of the God, the Bible, and... And that knowledge is going to fill the earth. Light, understanding, knowledge. Just like the water. Well, the water covers the sea, you know, uh, it, it covers completely and deep. Now, if that's how the restitution in the earth and the kingdom is going to be, come back to Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse 7. Here's our part. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Our part in the heavenly places is to show forth, is to put on display the exceeding riches of his grace toward us and his kindness. His grace and his kindness toward us. We're going to take the light. His life is in us. Through his body, it's going to be expressed all out there. That knowledge of the Lord. The mind of Christ in you. Working through. You with that? That's exciting to me. That's why he took you out of that condition of verse 1, 2, and 3. 
He didn't do it just to keep you out of hell. I'm glad he keeps us out of hell. But he had something bigger for you. He didn't do it to put you in the earth because he already had people to do that. He did it so he could do it to put you up here. But he did it so that he could show forth the riches of his grace. Now, next time, in our next study, I'm going to talk to you about how you're going to show forth the exceeding riches of his grace. Have you ever thought about that? Let me just put it like this. It says in the, what, age or ages to come? There's going to be more than one age. Eternity is made up of age after age after age. When it says world without end, that word there is age without end. The word world can be used in the sense of age. It can be used in the sense of a system. It can be used in the sense of the planet. You have to look at each verse and let each verse tell you. Okay? When he says world without end, chapter 3, verse 21, the ages will never end. In the Bible, the definition of eternity is that it just don't ever stop. One age after another age. Now, if you're going to have an age here to here, then you have another age. And if you're going to have an age that goes from here to here and you're going to show the exceeding riches of his grace, then you're going to have an age from here to here, you're going to show the exceeding. What's it got to exceed? got to exceed what you should put there. So whatever was there, the next age is going to be even greater. With me? Next age is going to be even greater. Eternity is not going to be a static time where you're going to get bored. There's going to be a continual, and if you've ever grown in maturity, you understand this, a, a continual exceeding riches. Not produced because the cross produces it all, but manifested. And I go, ooh. And I'm talk, I'll talk to you next time about, about how that's going to work. And there's something important to understand about what it is that's going to be manifested. And you'll see how it all fits right back here in that in original intention. I just want you to see one other thing before we leave. Come with me. You see when he says he's going to make show forth the exceeding riches of his grace, in connection with manifesting his glory up there, the knowledge, and the knowledge down here. Why don't you get two passages? Get chapter 1, verse 6, and, and, and Luke chapter 3. I'm sorry, it's Luke, Luke, well, Luke chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 6, Paul says, To the praise of the glory of his grace. All right, we're going to talk about the praise of the glory of his grace. Ultimately, there it is. You with me? Wherein, he hath, wherein, in the glory of his grace, he hath made us accepted in the beloved. In the glory of this grace that he's going to shine forth out here, he has made us accepted in the beloved. Isn't that wonderful? He could have said he made you accepted in Christ because that's what he's talking about. The only time, he, he, there, that isn't the only time he uses that term. But it's interesting that he uses it because he could have said, in Christ. And in fact, in Ephesians, it's his favorite expression, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. But here he says you're accepted. Your acceptance is in. The, now, the term the beloved, he used it. I think he used it so he'd make you think about where it came from. When you hear that term, in the beloved, what do you, is there a verse that comes to your mind? Matthew 3 or Luke 3. Luke chapter 3. Now when all, verse 21. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heavens were open. The heaven was open, I'm sorry. And the Holy Ghost des descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son. 
You're my beloved. In whom I'm well pleased. You know what it means to be beloved? You're one in whom the Father is well pleased. I'm excited about you, boy. <laughs> all, my, all my joy is in you. Psalm 16 says that the Father says, At his right hand is joy and pleasure forevermore. You know who sits at the Father's right hand? The one in whom he finds all his joy. It's interesting in Luke chapter 3 where he says, Thou art my beloved son. See that? In Matthew 3, the quote is, This is my beloved son. Matthew, the gospel of the kingdom, the, proving the credentials of the king, he says, I want everybody to see, That's, this, that's my beloved son. Declaration of authenticity to the crowd. Luke, the gospel of the humanity of Christ. He says, son, thou. That's a personal statement from the father to the son. He wasn't talking to the crowd, but he's talking to the son. I read that and I say, oh, the father loved him. The father didn't want his son to go on that journey that he's beginning there of that three years and a half years of ministry as the Son of Man without going in the assurance that the Father loved him above all things. When Jesus left that scene, he goes out into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. But as he went into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, you know who he went as? Thou art my beloved, in whom I'm well pleased. Now, if you're sitting there in your mind trying to figure out, wants oh, Brother Rick believe in the deity of Christ? Or is he trying to say, no? you're, not, you're missing it. You know I believe in the deity of Christ. But I also believe in his humanity. I can't explain it, I can just read it. And if all you're doing is just trying to pick a wing off of a fly or kick a gnat in the eye. Help yourself. I don't care. But you're missing something. Because even then the Father says, Thou art accepted in the Beloved. And the Beloved says, He says, Thou art my beloved son. In whom I'm well if you could ever let that grip you, you could relax and rest. And your flesh and the fair show of the flesh and all the rest won't mean a thing to you. Because the Father can do something. The Son can do something. It means to you what the Father does. And if He did, then the Father would mean something, mean to you what He meant to the Son. Jesus said, Without my Father, I can do nothing. Into me see. I want you to look at chapter 4. Because when Satan comes to tempt Christ, he's tempted of the devil. The term Satan means adversary. The term devil, you, you've heard the term, the, the, the word diabolos. That's the Greek word for devil. It's an interesting word. Dia is the word, it's a preposition that means through. Balo is the word for bowl. Ball. We get the word bowl, ball. So literally what the idea of a diabolos is, is to throw something between and separate you. So it's the devil, the one who's interested in people not retaining the knowledge of God, who comes to tempt the Son of Man, the Son of God. Verse 2, and being tempted of the devil, being 40 days tempted of the devil, 
verse 3, and the devil. Now, we usually define the word devil as slanderer. And that's the idea. You're separating a person from their true identity. Okay? Then comes the devil and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. Do you see what he left out? Jesus has ringing in his ear, Thou art my beloved Son. The devil doesn't say, if thou be the beloved Son of God. You know why he did that? Satan knew. He knew, as sure as you're sitting in that seat, that no temptation was going to be successful if Jesus Christ lived in the consciousness of being beloved. follow that? Yeah. And neither would you. Won't. Those that did not like to retain God, they're not, Satan doesn't want you to think about, he didn't want you to retain the consciousness of who God has made you in his son. And friend, let's just be Square about it. If he would do that to the Lord Jesus Christ <laughs> and think that was a tactic to win against the Lord Jesus Christ, don't you get the idea that he's going to have to use some more sophisticated method against you? You see, victory. What you're going to do out there in the ages to come, showing forth the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us, showing, your, showing what it is to be accepted in the beloved. Paul says right now, you're to yield your members as instruments unto righteousness as those that are alive from the dead. You know how you're to live now? Like that's who you are. You know why? Because that's who you are. You're not Israel. You don't need to be Israel. You're not going to be on the earth. You don't need to be on the earth. You aren't losing anything by not being there. That's who you are. Because that's who God made you. Woo. And that's why what's here, the issue is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The issue is his life. Because that's all that's going to be manifest out there. And by the way, to the degree that you develop the capacity for that to be your life now is the degree that you'll be able to do that out there. There is a correspondence between those two things. Okay? It's good to be saved, isn't it? <laughs> I'll talk to you next time about some of the specific. You see, my topic Sunday is the Day of the Lord. When we think of the Day of the Lord, that's all we think about. But when you read Israel's program, the day of the Lord is here. By the, by, when you read Israel's program, the day of the Lord started back over there with the captivity. Has a crescendo of the terrible, great and terrible day of the Lord, the wrath here, but it extends all the way out into here. Because here is where he restores, this is the time period where he restores the issue that Satan is trying to get rid of, which is not to return. Well, 
We've been to Be from Dan to Beersheba. I appreciate your patience. You've been very kind not to go to sleep. And uh, I don't want to just presume on you. I, I don't presume on you. I, I appreciate your, your kindness that way. But, folks, there's, there's, there's stuff in here about this that's more than just saying Paul's our. I know some of you just learning that Paul's your apostle. You're just learning that the dispensation of grace is, in, is, is data, dealt out to you through the ministry of the apostles. I know you're just beginning to learn that. Can I tell you, I hope you can see there's so much more to, to it than just that beginning. Some of you have known that Paul's your apostle for decades. I want you to see there's more to it than just that. Some of you are struggling with life today. I want you to know there's more to it than that. There's victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of you are real conscious of your own limitations. God help you. Bless your heart. Paul said unto, he said unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given. He lived with a consciousness of his limitations. But they weren't what lived in him. What did I say? <laughs> he lived with his limitations. He knew them. But he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. That wasn't what lived in him. It's not I, it's Christ. You see, it not being I but Christ is more than just a phrase and a catchphrase. It's life. And the way it works in your life, the way it becomes operative and life to you is when your faith Rest in an intelligent understanding of God's word rightly divided. And when you make the conscious choice of faith to say, I'm going to take every area of my life and I'm going to put it under the obedience, under, under the control of the obedience of Christ, under the control of who I am in him, I'm going to let that truth renew transform my mind, my thinking, and consequently my actions, because the life comes from within. Amen. Now, if you've come in here tonight and you've never really trusted Christ, if you can't see there's a difference between religion salvation and life in Christ, I hadn't spent the last hour and 20 minutes talking to you for a moment. Maybe you hadn't listened. But can I tell you, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to move a muscle. You don't have to make a deal with God. You don't even have to pray. Because prayer is a work in the body. You do know that. You say, well, doesn't the Bible says, who shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? You ever read the next verse? How shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? Calling is a response of faith. Faith is what saves you. You don't get saved. You say, I got, well, I prayed and asked the Lord. Prayed and asked the Lord to save you isn't what saves you. Believing. Resting your case exclusively on Christ. And that's a choice you make in your heart, a decision that you make to believe his word. And when you do that, God will save you right instant. I recommend you tell him. You talk to him. Begin, begin from then and spend the rest of your life talking to him. <laughs> okay? But don't go over in Romans chapter 10 and pull out one of, an, a, a verse Paul's writing about the nation of Israel and try to make it what make confusion for yourself. Just believe. You can give up religion. You can keep smoking your cigarettes. It's okay. No, I'm not. You heard me say it. I didn't say you should. 
if you're so dumb as to, you know, suck down coffins, coffin nails, go ahead. That isn't how God saves you. He doesn't save you on the basis of whether you smoke a cigarette or not. He saves you on the basis of whether you trust with his son. I hope you get that message. That's the riches of his grace and his kindness to us. And you know, for you, it had to be exceeding riches. He had to overpay for you, and he did. Father, we thank you tonight for our life, for our Savior. Father, we thank you for the riches of your grace, for your word. What a treasure it is to have your word in our hands, to be able to read it, study it, trust it, depend on it, and to know that it, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. That as we trust you, as we trust your word, as we trust the truth of who you say we are in Christ, and we let that life be what lives through us, it honors you. We thank you for that privilege. Thank you for these folks that come tonight. The joy that we have in a time like this, we just pray that this weekend might be something that we're that bears fruit all through those days of the ages to come for your glory.